Good day, everyone. My name is Dr. Sanya Khan, and I work at the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi in the Respiratory Institute as an interstitial lung disease physician. I am the director of the interstitial lung disease program, first joining the hospital in 2015. And we were part of the physicians who originally started the advanced lung disease program, which is one of a kind in the United Arab Emirates. Also joining me today is Dr. Isabel Abendano, who has recently joined us from the United States and is also an interstitial lung disease expert. Uh, both of us trained in the United States. We completed our residency and pulmonary critical care fellowships in the United States, following which we uh, are both niche practitioners in interstitial lung disease. And we'll talk a little bit about what interstitial lung disease, or ILD, as we'll be calling it, moving on in the podcast, means. All right. So the purpose of this podcast, obviously, is to raise awareness about the disease process and also what pulmonary fibrosis particularly is. And as we know that uh, these are things that are difficult to understand, uh, not only for patients, but for physicians mm -hmm. as well. And we have to go a long way in raising awareness for the topic of pulmonary fibrosis. Um, briefly, what we can say about pulmonary fibrosis is that it's almost like a premature aging of the lung, where the healthy lung tissue is replaced by scar or destructed lung tissue, where the lung eventually stops working, and it cannot carry out its functions of ventilation or taking oxygen in and, and all the other functions that's supposed to carry out. And Isabel, could you talk a little bit about things that can cause pulmonary fibrosis? Yeah, so pulmonary fibrosis can be produced or related with multiple uh, disorders. It's, um, sometimes uh, we cannot define exactly what was the reason or what is, what is the reason, but in a significant amount of cases, we can identify a trigger. Uh, more common is something you, we, are, we are exposed to. I always say the patients, we breathe air and everything that is in the air comes inside the lungs and can produce reaction. And uh, probably is one of the common reasons, different for each person, we think there is some predisposition. Uh, you can be in the same environment and don't develop the disease, but the person next to you uh, does. Um, the other common uh, reason is uh, autoimmune diseases, this uh, disorder that are, as are associated with um, antibodies. So one, it's, it's like a, the body fights against um, yourself or uh, the same tissues and sometimes the lungs can be affected as well. So those are probably the more common reasons um, besides, again, when we cannot identify exactly what, what is the explanation for the lung damage. And what we do know is that diseases, that these diseases or this group of diseases is still categorized as rare and orphan diseases. And what we are finding out is that different parts of the world have different patterns of this disease. Mm -hmm. And what is common, for example, in North America and Europe is not common here in the Gulf region. And what is common here is not as common in, yes, in North and, America. And, and I think that's related with, with different environment, uh, perhaps. Um, and it's probably we say orphan and rare. Yes, it's not the common, super common disease. Maybe for us, sounds common because we have been seeing patients like this for the last 20 years in our lives. But uh, probably it's more than we think. And it's important that the, the, even the community uh, being aware um, of symptoms that are not resolving. And even just talk to the primary care physician or the pulmonology, say, maybe I need to rule out this. And because if you are not thinking of the possibility, you can miss the diagnosis until it's too late. Uh, so that's, that's part of the reason to talk about awareness, like a, when we need to consider the possibility and try to get the diagnosis sooner. Yeah, and the, the thing with lung disorders is that most of them will have the same kind of mm -hmm. symptoms. Most of them will present with a cough, you know, um, uh, or most of, of them will be sh short of breath. And so many things that are insignificant will also present the same way. And uh, like you said, the right time would to, to think about something more uncommon or more sinister would be if somebody has uh, certainly pervasive, persistent symptoms. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps could you shed some light on what a primary care physician can actually do to decide when somebody needs a referral to yeah. a pulmonologist. Yeah, the symptoms exactly as, as uh, Sanya says are pretty similar, cough and shortness of breath. But it, the, 
the, the patient or the physician recognize the risk factors. Again, someone, especially with a, a disease that can predispose to it. For instance, patients with rheumatoid arthritis, that is not as rare disease, a percentage, a significant percentage, about 30, 40 percent of patients with rheumatoid arthritis can develop lung disorder, including lung fibrosis. And um, it, the, it can be, the symptoms can be difficult to um, detect because the patient can feel some shortness of breath, tiredness, because of the joint compromise. And these diseases are systemic diseases. So that the person feels sick, sick. So it's hard to, say, to recognize, no, my shortness of breath is worse. But if the physician knows about it, um, takes a image or decided to do lung function tests or even send the patient to the pulmonologist just for a screening because probably we, we will end up doing that in seeing that, I mean, we are seeing more and more cases, uh, unfortunately, again, in late stage. So I think uh, connective tissue disorders or when the symptoms are really persistent and cannot be explained for something else. I will say not everything is asthma, not everything is COPD. That is pretty common diagnosis um, among physicians. And even the, 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 now with the ability to uh, get information from the Internet, so the patients uh, know too much. And it's, it's, sometimes it's good that they are interested and they can ans um, ask and look for answers. But can be confused with, oh, no, this is your PD, this is asthma. If it's not clear, there is not improvement, look on think on something else. And so for the physician community, certainly you, uh, it's important to understand that there are certain people who have high risk factors, right? So particularly being male, elderly, beyond the sixth decade of life, somebody who's had a smoking history in the past, somebody who's had occupational exposures. And be very aware of what environment you live in. And what we find in the Gulf region, there is a, a higher, uh, I would say, degree of uh, pulmonary fibrosis, and particularly in younger people also. And our concern, of course, is what we can categorized as a biofuel exposure, uh, which is the burning of incenses um, that are prevalent in the environment that are certainly playing a role in evoking an immune response and chronic damage in the lung, which eventually leads to uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So those are things to be uh, aware of. Um, like you said, certainly just even doing a plain chest x-ray or plain pulmonary function tests um, can give you an idea that something is not right. Uh, but we can do things that are more accurate in getting us to a uh, diagnosis like a high resolution CT chest. Mm -hmm. And um, even in that situation, a diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease is not made in isolation. We usually sit down together as a group yeah where the pulmonologist, all the pulmonologists, the radiologists and pathologists, we sit together and we look at everything in a multidisciplinary way. Um, many things now, thankfully, can be recognized based upon uh, the clinical parameters, the radiographic parameters, and very rarely now do we need uh, biopsies, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which, is, is, which is an important thing to get to the diagnosis. Um, in terms of treatment options, obviously it's a multi-pronged approach. Uh, can you talk a little bit about yes. Yeah. yes, we have advanced in, in the possibility for treatment. Uh, years ago, there was basically nothing sometimes for these patients, especially the idiopathic forms. We didn't have anything to offer. Yeah. Uh, but now we, have, we, uh, we, we know more about this. And uh, I will say the big division is we have patients we can uh, put on immunosuppressive medicine. Um, and other patients that we can offer antifibrotic therapy that, that, as the name says, decrease the, the possibility or the speed of fibrotic changes. Um, and not only in patients with the idiopathic forms, but when we see progression of fibrosis in patients with another kind of uh, interstitial lung disease, we can use the antifibrotic and we have data, scientific data supporting that. And probably um, we will have more medicine, more drugs available for treatment uh, based on a lot of research. And I'm pretty sure in the next month or so, we will have news about uh, new agents that we can probably start using in our patients with idiopathic forms or progressive fibrosis of another kind. So yes, we have, and exactly as Sanya says, the more important is to be seen by physicians with the expertise, and again, we are no, uh, most of the time we don't 
the, the, the decision or the diagnosis is not made by one person. Always we need to get multidisciplinary approach. Uh, that means to talk to the other specialists that uh, can help to get the best consensus. And this is a standard of care in, 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 in US and Europe and here everywhere is clear that the multidisciplinary discussion helps with the treatment in terms of the, and, and the approach in general. So you have the best diagnosis, then the best approach is offered to the patient. And one thing to understand is that pulmonary fibrosis is not a static disease. It is almost always a progressive disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, varying, uh, various patients will progress at varying speeds. Uh, there are okay, certain risk factors which help us predict how somebody will do, but most of the time the physician and the patient find out together how somebody's disease is doing. And uh, so that's why it's very important for the patients to maintain care in a, with, with a certain pulmonary fibrosis clinic or, uh, or a center so that you have a con continuity of care and the ability for your physicians and your healthcare team to intervene if things are deteriorating. Um, one of the things, of course, people always ask is, how long do I have to take the treatment for? Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, how do you help them understand the chronicity of this disease and how for a patient and a family can treat, uh, yeah. can deal with the chronicity of the disease? Yeah, no, this is a disease, like a, I, I'm trying to say, like a more common diseases that we have been, or they recognize, or they know about it for a long time, like a systemic hypertension. So we say, I mean, we explain the patients, you have a disease that likely you need to be treated the rest of your life for. So, um, and, it's, and, and the family needs to be educated because it's, it's, an, it's, it's, it's hard to believe, especially young people, but even older patients that were probably pretty uh, fine before something like this, and they need to understand that support is important, but there is, there is hope, there is a treatment and a lot of support around, so it's basically, as you say, continue, the, continue care, um, being compliant with the medication, with, the, with what we recommend, and um, don't believe that this will be cured and stop the treatment. So the treatment probably, most of the time, I, a few cases we can stop. Most of, the, most of the time we say you need to continue with this uh, forever. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, uh, there's so much information out there on the Internet, and obviously when somebody is desperate to find information, they'll go looking for that information on the Internet, um, you see all sorts of things, everything from holistic to some very un unholistic options out there. Um, uh, everything from garden variety treatment to stem cell uh, transplantation. And what we always try and tell our patients is that there are few positive outcomes from certain well-done trials in the scientific world, and that is the data we follow. Yes, um, we really try not to follow aberrant data or, or weak data because of the, first of all, the seriousness of these diseases, the chronicity of these diseases. And we always advise people to be very careful about how they process the information that they receive, not only from the internet, but generally from the community as yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, it is a well-known thing that uh, pulmonary fibrosis is a progressive disease. Uh, despite treatment, uh, it will sometimes be actually worse than a cancer because a lot of cancers are actually treatable, but pulmonary yeah, fibrosis true. more often than not will be a terminal diseases. And then in a terminal situation, of course, we move towards lung transplantation. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so we, ha we can always, when we see these patients, we have we understand that eventually, in case of no response, we need to consider lung transplantation. So to be in an institute, an institution when we have the possibility to offer that is a big advantage. Uh, for interstitial lung disease doctors, always uh, we want to be in a place when the, the possibility of lung transplantation uh, is available. available because it's um, really important to, I mean, to, we know that. we. It's the last resource, but definitely in some patients that we we see this is progressive, despite of treatment, 
we need as well to send the patient as soon as possible for the evaluation of possible lung transplant. Because as we receive patients sometimes too late to start treatment, if we delay as well, the referral for lung transplantation will be even worse for the patient. And that's another reason to be seen by doctors who have more expertise because we know who really can, when is the moment to say, no, you need the lung transplant. Uh, because yes, it could be worse than some cancers when there is no response to therapy and, and then probably the only option is, is transplant. So be on time for that possibility. Yeah. And we're actually lucky here at the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi that we have from the start to finish the entire spectrum of not only just treatment, but diagnostic modalities, uh, diagnostic capabilities, uh, certainly treatment ab uh, ability and all the way up to lung transplantation yes. that we've been carrying out successfully uh, for the last couple of years. And we are lucky to have developed an advanced lung disease program, which collaborates very effectively with the community and all our local and regional pulmonologists who uh, refer patients to us, uh, particularly advanced lung disease patients, for uh, not only just diagnosis, but treatment and even transplantation. And another thing important is uh, this lung fibrosis itself can be associated with all the complications in the lung, like a pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary arterial hypertension happens when the pressure inside the lungs increases due to different reasons, but one of them could be interstitial lung disease or can happen that patient is referred with this diagnosis of possible lung fibrosis, and we, we are able to say this is a different disorder as well, serious disorder, but probably it's not lung fibrosis, the treatment or the approach is totally different. So this is another reason to look for care in places like Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi when we have the interstitial lung disease doctor, but we have the pulmonary hypertension doctors, the bronchiectasis. I mean, we have different specialties that when we have this discussion, sometimes we say, no, this patient needs to be seen by one of my colleagues that know more about this than by me. So this is another important point to recognize the association of these disorders with others that are as well are pretty serious. Um, and that's in, the important part to recognize that, uh, again, this is a multidisciplinary mm -hmm. uh, disease, even, even for lung doctors, that it's not only one kind of lung doctor that can provide yes, exactly. perhaps the entire spectrum of care, but we may require other subspecialists who help, uh, help us manage these patients, uh, not to uh, forget uh, the, the whole support system from our, our clinics, our clinic nurses, our coordinators, our respiratory, respiratory therapists, mm -hmm. our pharmacies, you know, it's, it's uh, challenging to procure some of these medications um, and, and uh, manage and monitor these patients while they are under treatment. So in summary, I think um, suffice it to say that um, we need to do more uh, in the general community for people to understand the serious and progressive nature of pulmonary fibrosis, um, understand when to look for it, uh, where to establish care, um, mm -hmm. continued care, um, and and uh, certainly uh, working very closely uh, for physicians especially also that we work, uh, we collaborate with uh, all other groups of physicians who are looking after these patients, whether they're at our center or they're outside of the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi to help manage these patients better. And with this, we conclude today's session on pulmonary fibrosis. We still have more work to do and more is yet to come. Uh, stay tuned. <laughs>